So we have to look at the how that uh, potential between matter and uh, neutrino comes about. Uh, I refer you to two things. One is uh, Sakurai has two books on quantum mechanics. This is the older book on relativistic quantum mechanics, where he discusses mod scattering using Dirac equation. So, mod scattering is the scattering of a relativistic electron of a Coulomb potential, but let us think of it this way. With a proton and an electron, and proton is this electron, it's relativistic, but it has energy, let's say, a, a mV or so, which is thousand times smaller than the rest mass of the proton. So <coughs> the momentum ex even if some momentum is exchanged, the proton will not move. You can take the proton to be essentially at rest. And you have a photon of momentum Q that is exchanged. Using QED, you can write down the matrix element for this process. And Sakurai describes how that matrix element converts into a potential which of course looks like minus e square by r which is the standard Coulomb potential between a proton and an electron. So this is the first point you should realize that the amplitude you write down for a Feynman diagram like this under appropriate kinetic limit and of course usually we write this in momentum space you have to go into the coordinate space and when you do so it, it looks like a potential. Yeah. In this case we are talking about one point scale. Right, right. So, first, first you, I want to emphasize how does the potential come. You write the matrix element and you take the appropriate kinematic limit and you go from momentum space to coordinate space and that gives you a potential. That's point number one. And point number two, I hope you are also familiar with this book of uh, Guilty and Kim, it is called uh, Physics and Astrophysics of uh, Neutrinos. It's a big tome. And basically, everything you want to know about neutrinos, and most certainly everything you want to know about neutrino oscillations, is discussed very well in this book. And in fact, what I am going to discuss in the class today is taken from chapter 9 of this book. <coughs> so, you 
can uh, refer to it. By the way, is the this one coming out fine? So we first let us consider the chart current. So I have a V going into electron and electron going into V. And we write down the amplitude for it, which is Gf by V2 to the power gamma alpha 1 minus gamma phi E to the power gamma alpha. And as I mentioned, I will make the field transform on it. So, Now, this is the, you can say, is the effective interaction Hamiltonian. And now, I take the matrix element of this. Between a initial state of electron and the final state of electron. I will consider only the electron states. I will not as of now consider the neutrino states. And, uh, and having taken the matrix element, then I integrate over the number of electrons in a given small volume V. I mean, this is another place where we have to be slightly careful regarding this. What is this volume V? It can be, it is macroscopic volume. So, it is much, much larger compared to the, the scales that are relevant here. But it need not be very large. So that with, within this volume we can take the density to be constant. So let's say 1 centimeter cube. So if you are considering earth as being made up of the matter, then in any given 1 centimeter cube I can take the density of earth to be constant. But certainly 1 centimeter cube is huge compared to the microscopic level where quantum mechanics operates. So that's the picture we should have. And uh, so we Consider the sort of as G F by two V bar gamma alpha one minus gamma phi e times Some 
same word plus minus one times an electron with momentum P density P. And the same electron state. Because what I am interested in is a scattering where the target, neither the target nor the projectile change their momentum. Why that is so, I will explain a little later. But important thing to realize is the final state electron and the initial state electron have the same momentum and same tensor. And what is this Fe of t? Fe of t is the probability distribution of the electrons in the given value volume as a function of momentum and for example this can be a that fermi function as a function of temperature and we have this density of electrons and V is the volume or under consideration. P is temperature here. But uh, I am not explicitly worried about what the temperature is. Me, when you did sort of elements of solid state physics, this is, a, this is the function that you would consider. And the function is normalized to something like this. That when I when you integrate over that function, you get the number density of electrons times the volume, which is equal to the total number of electrons. Why are we considering temperature? Function of temperature. Yeah. Because uh, that V function is usually a function of temperature. So I am writing it nominally. The temperature does not enter into my calculations at all. But I have written it, it I have explicitly put temperature here to indicate that this is true at all time. The discussion we are doing is true for all kinds of situations for neutrinos passing through earth, neutrinos passing through sun, neutrinos passing through supernovae, all of which have different temperatures. So the explicit form of this function for all those is different. Except eventually this is what we care about. And uh, since we are, we have formally introduced a volume, we will normalize our states using the so called box normalization rather than delta function normalization. So,
pieces, okay? So, now if you calculate this matrix element, oh, I forgot one thing, I should have put a factor half here, I'm summing over the two helicities, but I assume that my electrons are unpolarized. So, I have to average over the helices. So, there is a factor half. So, this matrix element, including that, is 1 over by the way, uh, one thing, yesterday while going through GUP, I noticed that in writing this equation, the square root sign was missing in that equation. But if you see the later equations, you realize that there was a square root missing here. So, this is uh, 1 over 2 EV times. So, this is a field, and when this field acts on this particle state, the corresponding momentum is picked up, and I am leaving behind a spinner of that momentum. So, I have V bar. And now I have to put a half and sum over eight e. So this half becomes one four. I sum over eight. So this is a row. This is a 4 by 4 matrix, this is a column, but I can write this row at the end and write it as face. This is the standard Casimir technique. So, this is 1 over 4 pb, trace, gamma alpha, 1 minus gamma phi, Bar sum over the densities, and we know what that sum over helicities is. It is one over four times trace gamma alpha one minus gamma phi times here one other portion regarding fermions there are two normalizations in one set of normalization there is a root 2 m here whereas in the other set of normalization there is no root 2 m and here we are not using the root 2 well. So when I do the when I do this summation over helicity, I get only P e slash plus M e. There is no by 2 m. And now you see that of the four terms, only one term will survive. Because if I look at this M e multiple trace gamma alpha is 0, trace gamma alpha gamma phi is 0 and p e slash gamma alpha p e slash trace is non-zero but 2 gamma matrices gamma 5 trace is 0 
No, no, no. It's just a convention. How you normalize your spinners. And here we are not using that tool in the normalization of my spinners. They are normalized to one. Sometimes they are normalized to E by M. <coughs> so this is one over four ECT times four times T e alpha beta e. So this is T e alpha by so that is what I have for this whole thing. So So, this is equal to C of I two mu bar gamma alpha one minus C of I two B integral Now, this P slash by P is P gamma zero minus P dot gamma divided by and now you note that when I do this integration dqpe, this one will vanish because the integrand is uh, anti-symmetric under p going to minus p e. So this term will drop out and this is here by root 2. 1 over V integral PE bar gamma 0 1 minus gamma by
and so the integral is is only this part because this is now independent of anything to do with electron momentum and that is gf by two and p by p Are the ones which engage have the weak interaction, and so this so this uh, neutrino current, so to speak. The time component of the neutrino current interacts with this potential ECC. And if you want to look at the dimensions, this PCC has dimensions of energy because GF is small g squared by m squared, so it has dimensions minus e squared. And Ne is number density, so it is 1 over L cube, so it is L power minus 3. But H cross C is MeV for me, so the length and energy have opposite dimensions. So L power minus 3 is. Dimensions of energy. So, <clears throat> this is how we get this potential which occurs when you have an a neutrino going through a cloud of electrons. Now, <laughs> let us look at it from a Different point of view. Sir. Yeah. Here we are looking at the electrons as if it's a cloud of electrons. With yeah. Some density distributed. Huh. Uh, but in, like, in reality, the electrons are many of the electrons will be bound to some. Right. Yeah. So but uh, let them be bound. So that's fine. It doesn't matter. Because uh, see, point is the scattering is not disturbing the electrons. We are talking about so called elastic forward scattering. So, let's say I have a box like this, and instead of having a uniform density, my the electrons. There is some cloud, there is some cloud here, there is some cloud here, there is some cloud here, etc. That's fine. The, the important point to realize is the interaction of neutrino with electron here is not disturbing the electron. It's leaving it as such. So the whole derivation we go
make a connection between what I talked about in mod scattering and what I have derived here. Let us, for example, consider I'll assume electrons are in the form of a lattice like this. It need not be evenly spaced lattice, but there are number of electrons among this. And I have a neutrino coming here and I have a neutrino going up. So the, the direction of the moment neutrino is, is not changing and I am also assuming magnitude is not changing. Exact forward elastic scatter. So, there is an amplitude for the scattering for the neutrino not to interact with any electron. Plus, there is an amplitude for one interaction. So that interaction can occur here, or here, or here, or here, etc., etc., anywhere. So, so this V is the small magnitude of interaction. And in, then, of course, there is possibility that two interactions can occur. So that is N C two times V squared plus order. And see, this is where the phrase coherent forward elastic scattering matters. The amplitudes add only for forward elastic scattering. Let's say the scattering takes place and neutrino goes off like that. That's a different state compared to this. So, in order to calculate probability of neutrino going off like that, I just square the power. Amplitude. But here there is a probability that rather there is an amplitude for no scattering and there is an amplitude for one scattering. And then I have to add all the amplitudes because all these amplitudes I am. I am adding the amplitudes, that is where the word coherent is coming from. And then I have to square this. And when I square this, you will find that the leading term goes like this. Leading term is linearly proportional, not quadratically. Whereas if it goes off like that, I will be looking at cross sections. I will not be looking at amplitudes. And, uh, and uh, we will see that in general this NV is small. So, we will cut off this expansion. We will not consider the higher order. So, that is where this whole that phraseology that coherent forward elastic scattering that is what is giving rise to this uh, scat potential giving rise to the potential energy of uh, the neutrino as it travels through matter. So the neutrino. Uh, yeah. Mass modified delta m, delta m square. Huh. Uh, that's more than the neutral. No, that will come to. No, we'll come to that discussion later. But 
here we are trying to understand how the potential is arising. So I was trying to think like how whether the potential, the sign of the potential is done. Mm. Is there any intuition why neutrinos will get a particular sign and anti neutrinos will get a. No, that is as simple as that example of the mod, mod scattering I gave you. So, you consider mod scattering of a relativistic electron with a proton and mod scattering of a relativistic positron with a proton. The potentials in the two cases will have opposite signs. Because potential between a negative charge and positive charge is opposite that of potential between positive charge and positive charge. As simple as that. So you don't need to think of, it, think of anything more complicated. And let us briefly discuss in the case of neutral current. So I have a mu alpha going into mu alpha. Where alpha can be e, mu or tau, doesn't matter. And this is the type zero. This can be electron, proton or neutron. And same final state particle. And I go through exactly same calculation I did before. And at the end of the day, you find that only the vector coupling of Z0 with electron, proton and neutron, they matter. The axial vector coupling doesn't matter. Remember, I took trace of uh, something gamma alpha 1 minus gamma 5 times some momentum. And I found that the gamma 5 term doesn't matter at all. The trace will always, trace of that will always be zero. So only the vector current matters and we find that using electroweak theory, we, we look up electroweak theory and look at the vector current and we find that to be This itself is quite small because sine square theta w is close to 0.14, it's 0.23. So this is very small. But more importantly, we find that for proton, it consists of two u quarks and a, and a d quark and we add the two things. And we find this is directly related to the charge and we find that so the vector coupling of proton and electron are equal and opposite and the number density of protons is equal to number density of new electrons in any neutral matter. So Protons and electrons actually together do not contribute to the matter potential and you find that and this turns out to be half. So the matter potential due to neutral current is minus half the times the neutron density.
So if you are considering a situation with uh, sterile neutrinos, you need to include the neutral current density and that counts out to be whether matter current, the matter effect due to neutral currents and that counts out to be this value. <coughs> and as I said, that VCC is there only for electron neutrinos, but VNC is there, it's common for electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and power. So now we get back to our uh, matter effects in neutrino oscillations. Uh, by the way, here uh, there is a lot of confusion in the sense different people use different notations and uh, they speak also in different books and different papers, they speak slightly different language. So I'm I've been using one particular language and I will continue to use that. But uh, be careful when you read even this PUT and Kim textbook or for that matter any of the original papers where the derivations are done they use different language and you have to sort of keep an eye on what is what <coughs> so we have So we have this differential equation, which is of course a coupled differential equation and you have and what we try to do is try to uncouple that so that we have two independent differential equations. So we say that mu e mu mu is cos theta m sin theta m minus sin theta m m depends on a and now I allow for the possibility that a can change with time. So which means that this om is not a constant, it changes with time. So I substitute it here and I get i dom dc and mu and mu to n plus 
of solar neutrino it is produced in the core of the sun and the density in the core of the sun is 150 grams per cc okay it's an estimate we have i think it's a quite an accurate estimate and then as whereas density at the edge of the sun is zero so I plot density of the solar matter as a function of radius. People have made a parameterization and they find that this exponential not okay. What I have drawn is not quite exponential, but an exponential profile baby is fits it quite well. So it should be more like this. When we say A is changing in time, actually it means that we are saying that the density is different. Yeah. At different times, the neutrino sees different densities. So the neutrino wave packet would have reached different places where the density is different. Right. Yeah. So I multiplied throughout with OM transpose. So I get I D D T mu one M mu two M is equal to one over four E OM transpose O M and then this term goes to that side. So minus I for E OM transpose DT for M DT on I want to write a Schrodinger equation for these two states new one and new two M. So in to do that, I take it to this side. Now, you can explicitly calculate this matrix, but you don't have to do that. One can show that, see, OM transpose OM is identity. So, if you differentiate this, right hand side you get zero and from this you can show that this matrix is anti-symmetric so the diagonal elements are zero and of course there is an i in front which means this anti-symmetric matrix is actually Hermitian and, hmm? no, no. and Purely imaginary anti-symmetric matrix is Hermitian, like sigma 2. And I choose theta m, as before I choose theta m so that this matrix is diagonal. So, my evolution equation now takes the form.
and if you work it out, you find that this is T theta and T C. So, in general, of course, it is one difficult to solve this equation. And here we make the so called means that if a state starts out as new 1m, it remains new 1m throughout and if, it, if a state starts out as new 2m, it remains new 2m throughout. So, to give a more pictorial this one. Imagine imagine an infinite potential well and the width of the potential well doubles. And suppose I put a particle in the ground state and if I increase the width of the potential well very very slowly then the particle will remain in the ground state at each successive time and eventually will be in this ground state and similarly if I put it in a first excited state to start with and slowly change the slowly change the width of the well then eventually it will be in the first excited state. Another way of looking at it is suppose I put the particle in the ground state and I slowly change the, the width. Okay, the fact that I am changing the width means I am doing some work in changing the width which means I am either giving energy or taking away energy from the body. But, the 
the rate at which I am giving energy to the particle or taking energy away from the particle is very very small. Whereas if there is to be a transition from ground state to first excited state, the particle has to get a sort of jolt of energy. Only then the transition can take place. It means that the eigenstates of any potential well are what are called adiabatic invariants. If you make a slow change on these potential on any such this one, then they do not have so a particle which was in the original state continues to remain in that state of course adjusting itself in such a way that it will be the eventual eigenstate of the changed well look at this these are what we call instantaneous eigenstates. If I am neglecting these, what I have are instantaneous eigenstates. So, what I have an eigenstate at 1 second is not the eigenstate at 2 seconds. The eigenstate at 2 seconds, t equal to 2 seconds is, I mean, suppose at these. See, u1 f is cos theta and mu v minus sin theta and mu v. Nu e, nu mu are fixed states. But theta m at t equal to 1 second is not same as theta m at t equal to 2 seconds. So, in that sense, nu1 m at t equal to 1 second is not nu 1 m at t equal to seconds. They differ. But the important thing is as the potential is changing and if it is changing very slowly and what do I mean by changing very slowly? In our case this is what it means. This d theta and dt has to be small but small compared to what? We quantify it by this equation. And if the potential is changing slowly, then a particle which is kept in the lower eigenstate, lower mass eigenstate, will continue to be in the lower mass eigenstate and the particle which is kept in the higher mass eigenstate will continue to be in the higher mass eigenstate. <coughs> and so let us say at mu at t equal to 0 is mu e. Yes. An electron neutrino is produced in the core of the sun. And I should write it as a linear combination of mass eigenstates corresponding to the density at the core of the sun. So that is cos theta core mu1 core plus and mu at time t is cos theta c times mu 1 at time t plus sin theta c times nu 2 at time t. Hmm? No, no, 
this is theta n but by here I am putting c because theta c is the angle which which is what I get when I take the density in the a term I take the density to be the density at core Theta m itself varies. Yeah, theta m is a generic label. Whereas theta c is the particular value when the neutrino is at the core of the, when the neutrino is at the core of the sun. So And uh, Sorry, the last question. Mm -hmm. UNC is zero. Hmm? Neutrinos, UNC is zero. No, UNC is evolving into the lower mass eigenstate at time t. What is this? This is exponential minus i integral minus delta n square m.
So if I take I get cos theta c times I call this some e power i phi. Times plus sine e power c. And based on what I just said, this is cos theta n. So and that is sine theta m. And the probability that a new E produced at the core of the sun comes out of the sun as a new E. And when I say comes out of the sun, out just at the surface of the sun, density is zero, which means theta m is actually the vacuum mixing angle. So this is cos square theta c, cos square theta b. I have changed m to b because at the edge of the sun, the relevant mixing angle is the vacuum mixing angle plus plus. some factor based on theta c theta m times cos 2 phi and this one can write as half plus half cos 2 theta c cos 2 theta b plus Now I argue that see remember this is a function of energy but when I or rather actually no, uh, I should be careful. Not as a yeah. Now I will argue that this quantity should be 0. Why is that? I am talking about production of the sun at the core of the sun and looking at the neutrino, production of the neutrino at the core of the sun and looking at it on the surface of the sun. Now, core of the sun 
is expected to have a radius of one tenth of the radius of the sun. And the neutrino can be produced anyway. So if I have a neutrino can be produced here, 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 here. or for that matter here and go like that. Anyway, within that small sphere, the neutrino can be produced. So, which means this pi is not a constant value, but for a, depending on the production point of the neutrino, the value of pi changes. So, to, to do a proper calculation of this survival probability, what I need to do is to estimate the probability of production at a given point and fold that in with this cos 2 phi and do the integral. However, we want a solution to solar neutrino problem and that requires delta m square of the order of 10 to the minus 5 dc square. And you put the delta m, this value of delta m square here and calculate phi and then consider the variation in T which comes from going over this you find that this phi changes over hundreds of cycles therefore no matter what is the probability distribution of production of the neutrino in the core of the sun since this phi is changing over hundreds of cycles the average value of that will be 0. So, we neglect that. But, and I emphasize, that is true for if we take delta m square up about this. In other situations, you may have to worry about this. But, the solar neutrino problem, the solution to solar neutrino problem as given by Mikhail and Spetnov assumes that delta m square is of this order and if delta m square is that much then the uncertainty in the production point of the neutrino within the sun makes this phi vary over hundreds of cycles therefore one can neglect one can set this term equal to z so we have the neutrino survival probability for a solar neutrino Theta vacuum is some number, so there is nothing, nothing complicated about it, but let us take a look at this term. So, cos 2 theta c is equal to
क्वेश्चन इज इज कॉस टू थीटा सी पॉजिटिव और नेगेटिव दट डिपेंड्स ऑन वेदर this matter term at the core is more than this or less than this for the moment let us assume delta n square is positive so and remember ac is 2 2 number of electrons at the pole times energy by the way this is translated into 0.76 into 10 to the minus 7 rho at the pole in grams per cc times the electron number density we translate into matter density and uh, i mentioned at the core of the sun density is about 150 grams so this turns out to be 10 to the power minus 5 and units of ac is ev square same as and you see where the 10 to the power minus 5 ev square is coming from so let us take delta m square to be 10 to the power minus 5 ev square and theta actually very small so that cos 2 theta is small. so if e is less than 1 mm a core is less than this and cos 2 theta c is positive and of course cos 2 theta is positive which means probability is greater than uh, greater than half yeah e is in mev ac is in ev square energy is to be specified in mv ac has same units as delta m square so Energy square, energy square, and the units are e v square. So, if e is greater than certain cut off, then rather if yeah if e is less than certain cut off then cos theta core is positive and pe for below that cut off will always be greater than 0.5 whereas above the cut off cos theta c becomes negative which means pe falls below half so you will have this behavior This is 
called EA or the adiabatic threshold. How do I determine EA? That is determined by the matter term which is a function of energy, matter term at the core which is a function of energy. When E is equal to EA, it should be equal to delta n squared cos theta v, which means EA in this case is delta n squared cos theta v. EA in MEV. And the great thing is uh, solar neutrino data comes to us from various different sources in the sun. Some of them have low energies below 0.5 MeV and some of them have high energies up, going up to 15 MeV. And we do find if we from the data we have to do some jugglery to extract this E versus E curve and if we do that we do find this pattern and not only that and this tells us that the delta n square in the solar neutrino problem is positive because imagine if delta n square is negative then cos theta at the core is negative and it will the mixing angle will it will continue to be negative the matter dependent mixing angle will always be negative so you will find that the PEE will always be below 0.5 if delta n squared had been negative but we do find at very low energies PEE greater than 0.5. Therefore, we believe that delta n square is actually positive as far as solar neutrino are concerned. And we are able to do so because we are able to see this sort of, I prefer to call it interference effect, but people don't like it but can at least say the comparison of these two and it is because of this comparison between matter term and the delta n square term that we are able to tell that delta n square is positive and we will try to do something similar in atmospheric neutrinos also. As of now we haven't been able to do so but that is the hope. And this thing is called MSW resonance because if you plot if you plot sine square to theta matter versus energy at E equal to zero I have the vacuum value and I am assuming that the vacuum value is small so it will be very small and let me write the This denominator. So as the energy keeps, as far as 
sin 2 theta m is concerned, numerator is fixed. Dependence is purely in the denominator. And uh, you find that as energy keeps increasing, this quantity keeps becoming smaller and smaller. So, this thing keeps going up. Denominator is becoming smaller. So, and it takes maximum value 1 when these two are equal. And then for larger values, this becomes larger again and sine squared to theta falls down. And this maximum again occurs at this so called adiabatic threshold, which is also called the resonance energy because this one looks just like a resonance. And even the dependence, like omega naught minus omega whole square plus something square, that's how the resonance looks. And when omega equal to omega naught, I have the maximum response. So this is also the, the same that Ea, it is also called the resonance energy and it is also called the adiabatic pressure. Even if the initial neutrinos are not, not even near the Ea, still hmm. there will be uh, deficit. Suppression because of this. No, even if we move to the right network, uh, to huh. the right of EA, huh. there is still suppression. Yeah, there is suppression. It's not like the suppression is maximum at the resonance. Or no, 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 no. Suppression. I mean, suppression is given by this. No, this is. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, actually, let us plot this. Let's plot this assuming theta equal to very, very small. Then you see why the Mikhail spin of uh, the original Mikhail spin of this, there was no data, at, there is very little data at the time. So they assumed theta is very small, some 3 degrees or so. So when theta v is 3 degrees, cos 2 theta is essentially 1. And the resonance condition is delta m square is equal to AC. Uh, that's the adiabatic threshold. But let us assume energy is greater than adiabatic threshold. First, let us assume energy is less than adiabatic threshold. So, basically, I neglect this compared to this. And I have a probability essentially equal to 1 maybe 0.9. Now my energy starts increasing. So probability starts falling slowly. But once I cross the adiabatic threshold, then this is essentially minus 1. And this is close to 1. So this is this vanishes. So, my probability becomes like this. So, let us say my adiabatic threshold is, I don't know, 6 MeV, just to, just for an argument. So, until 6 MeV, all the neutrinos survive. And beyond 6 MeV, all the neutrinos get converted. Complete conversion, that is the important thing. Once a neutrino has energy greater than 6 MeV, it is guaranteed to come out as a new mu. It will not survive as a new mu. So then you say that, okay, Ray Davis in the energy range 1 to 15 MeV, he saw one third. So, where do you put the adiabatic cutoff? 
that was the game that was played when uh, the proposal was first made but later of course people did more sophisticated analysis etc etc but uh, this is the most striking thing that below the adiabatic threshold I mean, assumption is mixing the vacuum mixing angle is very small that's an assumption mind you that is not true Camelot definitely tells us that we need large mixing angle similarly snow also tells us that we need large mixing angle but the original the big puzzle is how to get one third suppression and of course with three flavors in principle you can get one third suppression but what these people said is in two flavors you have this dynamical changing of the mixing angle and because of which below the adiabatic threshold all the solar neutrinos electron neutrinos come out as electron neutrinos above the adiabatic threshold all the electron neutrinos get converted to neon So to get the one third factor, where do you put the adiabatic threshold? So, and that was the really dramatic thing, which is why, like practically everybody doing particle physics got excited about the Michaels Pinot paper. In particular, great man Hans Peter, who sort of rework their arguments and presented them in a way that most people can understand. And in fact, uh, Hans Peter lived, he died only in uh, 2007 or so, by which time it was uh, known that the mixing angle in solar physics is large. But it seems he was very unhappy about it. That, I mean, he really loved this small mixing and angle being amplified to large values. Okay, I will stop now. And uh, in the next class, I will qualitatively discuss matter effects in three flavor oscillations as they are relevant to long baseline experiments and uh, atmospheric neutrino experiments.